Welcome, welcome to another interview episode of Tollcast, the podcast of the German Tolkien Society. Today's guest is none other than Brian Sibley. We had the chance to interview him in November 2022, just shortly before the release of The Fall of Numenor. Normally our podcast is in German, but every so often we get to interview amazing people. And these sessions remain in the English original. To get to the regular podcast episodes and to the German translation of this interview, just follow the link in the description. Now, have fun and enjoy the interview with Brian Sibley. Hello and welcome to another episode of Tollcast, the podcast of the German Tolkien Society with another special interview episode with none other than Brian Sibley. Hi, Brian. Hello, Annika. <laughs> good to be with you again. It's so good to have you again. Third time. This is like a lucky number. It's so good that um, you're doing interviews with us and uh, you do it so eagerly. <laughs> oh, really, my pleasure. This is really good for us. So... The Fall of Numenor, mm. book you've been slightly involved with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's mostly the work of uh, J.R.R. Tolkien and his son, Christopher Tolkien. Uh, <laughs> you know both of these characters too well for me to bother to try and say who they are. Um, uh, yes, uh, and a very exciting project, really, for me, because uh, the, the, uh, the idea was, could we put together a book that would bring together as much as we can of J.R.R. Tolkien's writings about the Second Age. Mm -hmm. Because the Second Age is obviously hugely important. Um, now, people are only many people are only just becoming aware of just how important the Second Age was because they, they are, are now aware of the TV series that has been produced by Amazon Prime called The Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power. And that series will, for many, many people, I think, be an introduction to a part of the history of Middle Earth that they just really will not be aware of. You know, I, I think everybody who's ever seen the, the film, Peter Jackson's films of The Lord of the Rings and, of course, The Hobbit, anybody who knows those stories will know all about how Gollum finds the one ring and then Bilbo wins it from him in a riddle game and how that ring passes to Frodo and then everybody understands for the first time just the, what this ring is, that it's not just a, a nice magical ring that can make you invisible. It's actually a very, very powerful ring that has been forged by Sauron, the Dark Lord, and that it controls other rings, or was made, in fact, to control a lot of other rings held by different peoples in Middle-earth. So we know all that bit of the story, but the Second Age is the period in which that event happens. Those rings are forged and the one ring is made. And so it's a very, very important prequel, as people would say today, to what happens in The Lord of the Rings. Because without those events having taken place, there would be no one ring to <laughs> try and throw into the fires of Orodruin. It's really important that people suddenly discover that the ring which Frodo carries into Mordor and which finally gets thrown into the fires of Mount Doom, that that ring has this whole backstory to it uh, of its creation and the involvement between the, the elves and the dwarves and the uh, and the way in which Sauron over uh, overshadowed that that process so that those those craftsmen the craftsmen of the dwarves and the and the brilliance of the elven smiths that those people working together created these wondrous things but how that was corrupted and used by Sauron uh, in order to gain great power in the world. So this is a whole story that for many people will be new. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's really exciting for people. I hope it will be exciting for people. Um, but of course, what people who know about Tolkien, and so all of your listeners will know this, that there is not a huge amount written about the Second Age. Mm -hmm. there, there is quite a bit about some aspects of it. But since the Second Age r lasts for several thousand years, uh, then 
it, it is only we have these kind of snapshots of different times through the second age events that took place and all of them are, have their own significance um, and, and of course the most formative of them at, right at the beginning of the second age is the fact that the, the, the elves and the men the first and second born uh, fight together to overthrow Sauron's master actually Morgoth uh, at the end of the first age of Middle Earth and that they have as a reward the men are given this special place where they can go and live an island called Numenor and it is set off from well if you think of it like this it lies between Middle Earth which is the world we're aware of in the Lord of the Rings and the the, the lands and places where the Valar live, where the creators of the whole, where Eru Iluvitar and, and the other Valar have, have for, for their abode. And it is at that point a flat world. This is a really interesting thing that a lot of people, I think, will come to as being completely unaware of that this is the <laughs> case, that this is a world which is a flat disc world. Um, Terry, long before Terry Pratchett created disc world, <laughs> you see. Um, and, uh, and of course, the idea of a flat world is something which runs through a lot of different mythologies is um, in Terry Pratchett's case of course it's the flat world is carried by four elephants traveling on the back of an enormous turtle who's flying <laughs> through space uh, but th that's that itself is drawn from other mythologies so it's, it's Tolkien was writing about something which was part of the whole mythological way in which people have looked at the world and how it was created and how it came to be um, but the events of the Second Age bring about a complete transformation. And because the men of Numenor, who are given this blessed realm, really, which is halfway between the land where they fought and laboured uh, against evil and the, the residences of the, let's call them the gods, because Tolkien was prepared to call the Valar the gods, um, the, the gods on the other side of the ocean and, and they're, they are set there between the gods and between the abode of men as it were you know between earth and heaven perhaps is a way of looking at it though Tolkien wouldn't probably have put it in that way <laughs> at all um, but this island is, is, is a perfect place for them and they have a great life there and they have a long life and they're able to do um, make and create amazing things and they become great voyagers and discoverers but they are eventually corrupted by Sauron because Sauron has his desire to be the king of the world to be the ruler of everything and he first of all brings insinuates his way into their culture and brings about the complete corruption and eventual collapse and as a result of their the disobedience of the people of Numenor, the world is dis their world, the world of Numenor is destroyed, it's overthrown like in the the, the, the much much older mythology of Atlantis the world is is destroyed and becomes is no more uh, and that idea is something that was very important to Tolkien so Tolkien had this great I, this Tolkien had this dream about a wave that overtakes the world uh, we we know about the story of the myth of Atlantis for example and films have been made and books have been written about that Tolkien wanted to tell his own Atlantean uh, story and it was something that you know obsessed him from years before he'd written the lord of the rings on it was this long running idea in his mind and he looked for diff lots of different ways to try and tell this story and we talk about those in the book and all your mm -hmm. readers will know about uh, the lost road and they'll know about the notion club papers and they'll know about all of those sources um, but it becomes the heart of what he tells in unfinished tales and the silmarillion and we now know, because of Christopher's editorship, and a lot of other places too, there are passages about Numenor and what happens and the forging of the rings. So the aim of the book was to try and bring together into one place as much of that storytelling as we could in Tolkien's own words so that people who've just seen this or the start of this uh, great epic run of uh, television programmes can, can find out what Tolkien actually wrote and what the story mm -hmm. was so how long were you on this you know detective <laughs> journey to pick together all of those i'd say almost loose ends and bring them together into one publication 
Uh, well, uh, less time than you might imagine, actually, because it was a very, very tight deadline on the book. Um, so it was quite a, a, a struggle. I had COVID in the middle of it, which meant that I worked very, very slowly, or even slower than I normally work, which is quite slow. Um, <laughs> and were, I, I think altogether, and, I, and this includes the volumes of The Lord of the Rings and would include uh, the volume of Tolkien's letters as well, I think I, ha- I was using about... 12 or 13 volumes in in all some of them it was just for a a, a small entry or a paragraph Uh, others obviously at great length Um, but uh, it it was it it was a detective job as you say but it was also a sense of how to arrange this material and very early on my when I was asked if I could do this my proposal was to was simply to follow the tale of the years uh, uh, the Tale of Years, which is in the appendices to The Lord of the Rings. And The Tale of Years has, as your readers, listeners will know, as your listeners will know, The Tale of Years has a date and an event that took place. And some of it is very, very, you know, very short. The founding of a reggae, and it will say, that's it, um, and a date. Uh, and then this king comes to power, this ruler, um, this event happens. Sometimes more information than others, but essentially it's just a series of dates running across over 3,000 years. And that was going to be my structure, because I thought all of the events that I'm reading about in all these books, they all happened within one of these periods. Mm -hmm. So if I take these as the markers, if you like, uh, and then within that year or series of years, uh, I will tell what happened or put together Tolkien's telling of what happened within that period. So that's how the book is arranged. And then adding to that uh, in... uh, in Tolkien's line of Elros, which lists all the rulers of Numenor yes. with their dates and how old they were and how long they lived and so on, I would incorporate all of that information. So whenever a king appears, we have a special kind of colophon in the book, which designed by Alan Lee, which shows the the head of the um, uh, of uh, well, a representation of what the the, the scepter of of the rulers of mm-hmm. Numenor would have looked like so that we know we're looking at this king or that queen. Now, sometimes Tolkien tells us nothing about that ruler other than the length of their reign. Um, and, and other times there's an awful lot of knowledge about what happened in that during that reign. <laughs> so sometimes there's still obviously a lot of gaps because we don't have anything to put in those gaps. And, uh, and it's not that they're missing because in many cases Tolkien created uh, um, just that bit of information to, to fit into the period of the, the time. So he may never have explored the, the rules of or the reign of some of these rulers at all. He may never have even you know, explore what he might think of having put there, uh, but they're there as a kind of marker in the in the in the history. Uh, but there are plenty of periods where there's a huge amount talked about. So mm-hmm. we know all about you know Galadriel's journeys and where she goes and the relationship between the the dwarves of Casadum and and the elves and how they work together to in, in a creative way. You know, we we mm-hmm. think of them. We get the picture in the Lord of the Rings that there's some kind of rivalry, but well, there is a rivalry between the dwarves and the elves, and yet at this point they were working together in harmony to create something yes. beautiful. Uh, why did the dwarves end up in uh, Casadum in in, Mor- why, in Moria? Why were they there? They were there because they'd lost, they'd worked through all the uh, precious metals that they could find in the north, so they travelled south. Uh, and you know it places a lot of things it gives you a new context for things Mm -hmm. and it introduces a lot of characters who people will not necessarily be familiar with you know there's a passing references to a character called Kelly Brimbor who was an elven smith and there's a lot of mystery about his ancestry where he comes from different stories um so the 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 thrust of the book was to try and draw all that together but at the same time to provide for people a route to find out more about this so um the back of the book there's a lot of pages of notes now you don't have to read the notes i'm happy to say if you don't want to but if you do want to read them you'll find there telling you if you want to know more about this part of the story or there's another version of this that can be found here because tolkien obviously revisited some of these things and as you know and your listeners know 
it, the history of Middle Earth is full of different early drafts that Tolkien was working on. So quite often, if there's an important variation, I try to point people to say, there's an alternative version of the story here. Yes. Um, so it's trying to bring all those things together in one place as far as it's possible. Um, so uh, what's actually in the book, which I can now talk about, uh, because the embargo is no longer on me, so I can actually say. <laughs> but it's probably, I probably don't need to say much because it's probably everything uh, or most of what you would expect to be there. Yes. You know? So, I mean, what books would you expect me, Annika, to be drawing from? <laughs> so it would be the history of Middle Earth. Okay. It would be Unfinished Tales. Okay, let's start with Unfinished Tales. Yes. So Unfinished Tales, you've got the Akelabeth. You, you sorry, let's start with this. Let's yes. start with the Silmarillion actually. <laughs> that come, was the third thing I was going to say. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll come back to, we'll come back to Unfinished Tales. Let's start with uh, the Silmarillion because that's kind of like the key the key work here because you've got of course you've got the whole of the history of the first age. You've got the uh, the Silmarillion itself, and then you've got the Akelabeth, and you've got of ring of the Rings of Power, mm -hmm. and those two sources uh, are the key sources of those uh, events relating to the well to both things about Numenor and and to the Rings of Power and the forging of them. So those and what I have done is they don't necessarily follow. You don't get the whole of the Akelabeth and then the whole of of Rings of Power. They're kind of interwoven, intercut. Sometimes if there's an overlap, I've either had to choose one version over another or I have omitted one and chosen, you know, given preference. Mm -hmm. but, but, but usually noted where, where the other version is. In every instance there, you're told where you can go back to the original books. And I want to say that because it's very important to me and to the publisher and to the estate that people don't think what, what this is is a way of saying oh, this replaces Unfinished Tales and the Silmarillion mm -hmm. and, and uh, the, these volumes of the history of Middle-earth. It, it doesn't. It's not about supplanting them because it's Tolkien's own work. But what I've tried to do is to arrange it <clears throat> in a way which means that people can now read it chronologically as a history of a, of a time mm -hmm. rather than bits in different volumes, which is how they were given to us as Christopher was doing his research, really. You know, if Christopher had done all his research and then written his books, they would have been quite different. But mm -hmm. he, his his books of uh, a history of Middle Earth are themselves a kind of journey of a voyage of discovery for him. So, so all of those elements are are there in the book um, from the Silmarillion, um, unfinished tales. There's the whole story of uh, uh, Alderian and Arendis, mm -hmm. which is a long story in in unfinished tales. Most of it, well, it's all there in the book, in The Fall of Numenor, but it's now uh, appears according to the time frame of when things happened. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Aldarion's first voyage um, <clears throat> takes perhaps, I think, two or three pages in Unfinished Tales. So that appears, and then we go back to what else is happening in Numenor and in Middle-earth in that period. And then we pick up again later in the, mm -hmm. in the story with Alderian. So it's, it's a case of arranging the material in a, in a chronological way. It's my obsession. You know, when I did the radio <laughs> version, everything had to be chronological, mm. and it's the same approach here. And I hope it will make it easier for people to read, but also give them enough markers and pointers to where they can go and read more. So people will want to know, is The Lost Road and is, are the Notion Club papers in the book? And the answer is no, they're not. Uh, but they are fully discussed mm -hmm. and introduced. And the Numenorean chapters in uh, The Lost Road uh, are in the book because um, Christopher designated them as the Numenorean chapters. It's chapter two and three of the of the book, or is it three and four? Whatever it is, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's the two chapters from The Lost Road that were of all the stuff that was written. And there is, of course, a lot at the beginning, and then Christopher reassembled what followed. But those two chapters specifically <clears throat> relate to incidents that happen uh, in the chronology that we later emerged. Mm -hmm. So they appear as an appendices at the end. So they're there with all of Christopher's notes, because I wanted to keep all his notes relating to the, everything in them, uh, and an explanation of how 
they differ from the events that happen because some of the people's names are changed, for example. Mm-hmm. But the elements of the story of of there being um, an overthrow of the world and an assault on the Valar by uh, by Sauron, uh, although he's not Sauron at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, so all of that is is in there, but it's it's just separate. You can read it or not. Other things are not there so there may be some people who complain and i'll just say this in advance in case you get complaints uh there is not the disaster of the gladden fields now i know that the disaster of the gladden fields is a great narrative actually and it's got wonderful dialogue in it and in that much i would love to have included it but actually it's not in the second age because the second age ends with the fall of sauron that is the end of the second age Mm -hmm. and so it's one of the first events in the third age when isildur uh, is killed and the ring gets lost so that Gollum can find it eventually um or schmeagel at that time a deagle and schmeagel going fishing um that uh that event is is crucial but it the story in the, in the disaster of the gladden fields differs from the way in which it's told uh in the of rings of power and in the appendices so essentially what i wanted to do was to give people the option of knowing if you've read this and you'd like to know the other version here's where you yeah. go and read it so that's the kind of example of so so all of those things but additionally to that the stuff from the peoples of middle earth mm-hmm. for example uh, there's a description of numenor which uh, tolkien gave us which i have worked together with the material from the nature of middle earth from carl hostetter's uh, fine volume um, to bring together a whole picture of the island uh, its geography, its uh, wildlife, its human life, the culture of the people, their their work, their pastimes, their faith and beliefs. So all of that is how we begin the book, really. A sense of Newman, giving you a real sense of Newman, or drawn from various sources. And then we go into the, the, the story uh, and we draw from, as I say, um, The Defeat of Sauron is another book from which passages are drawn. And one or two others as well, um, sometimes just bits. And the letters of Tolkien, because Tolkien wrote quite a lot about Numenor mm-hmm. in letters to people. And so I've incorporated those passages either as um, editorial asides, as it were, telling you this is what he said to so-and-so at this date, uh, and and also worked in, which I hope people will enjoy, and I hope people will realise this how this ties in with the Lord of the Rings itself, are passages which are uh, where people in the Lord of the Rings are talking about or referring to events in the Second Age. Mm-hmm. So, for example, at the Council of Elrond, uh, yes. Elrond himself and Gandalf talk about those events. You know, Gandalf actually tells the council how he went to the... Uh, libraries at Minas Tirith and went through all the old documents there and he found a document that Isildur had made after he had taken the ring from Sauron's hand Mm -hmm. Uh, and he talks about how it felt hot to the touch when he puts it on now he's quoting these documents written by Isildur immediately after the after the fall of Sauron and so those are now incorporated into the book because they are you know, documents yes. of that age told to us by Gandalf, but they're there. Wow. And similarly, for example, when we're talking about Khazad-dûm and, and the destruction of Khazad-dûm as a result of Sauron's at- attacks on that air, on that part of the world, um, there is uh, um, Gimli's lament that he he speaks when they the, the fellowship are travelling through yes. Khazad-dûm, when he talks about the glory that was, and, and, and from the same period, for example. Uh, at the, at the um, for also from the Third Age, at the Council of Elrond, where Glowin talks about how they delved too deep and dangerously mm-hmm. and awoke the, the Balrog and so on. So wherever there's a key event, or or the or the, the little verse about the the ships that are sailing when when Gandalf is riding with Pippin to Minas Tirith, mm-hmm. uh, which ties in with uh, the uh, exiles. Um, surviving for the, the fall of Numenor. So all of those things are sort of woven in. And, and one that I'm particularly fond of, uh, and I credit my my editor, Chris Smith, because it was his, he, he spotted it and reminded me of it. 
there's a moment when Faramir and Eowyn are standing on the battlements at, at uh, Minas Tirith. Mm-hmm. They don't know what's happening out there, you know, in front of the gates of, of Mordor. They don't know what, what's going to happen when the, when the battle happens. They have no idea where Frodo is or whether he's dead or whether he's been captured, whether he, Sauron's got the ring back or whether they've still got the ring or, you know, whether they will be able to destroy. There's a moment of enormous tension and... Uh, Faramir standing on the battlement says to Eowyn this reminds me of a dream that I had of, of uh, or, or, or she says that it, it's like a, he says it's like a great wave that's sweeping in mm-hmm. and we mm-hmm. don't know what it will bring uh, and says it, it's a dream I've had since I was since I was young and clearly right there <laughs> at that moment uh, Tolkien is embedding this dream of his own that he Mm -hmm. had when he was a young man so those things are fed into the story either in the body of the book or sometimes in the notes if it seemed like a too much of an intrusion you Mm -hmm. can read it in the notes so that's the the idea of it um i i think that people who who have watched uh, the Amazon series since it started will maybe we will be surprised <laughs> that it isn't quite like what they've been watching on the television. <laughs> yeah. um, but I hope that for Tolkien fans, it will bring a lot of that material together. And particularly, I'm conscious because I've been to- when I was when we were back at uh, uh, the Tolkien Ting earlier in the year. Um, I know a number of people said to me, we don't have access in Germany uh, to all of these. The the history, volumes of yes, the history of yes. Middle Earth. So some of this material and and the fall of Numenor is, is being translated by Helmut Pesch. So he's he's I know doing a great job on the translation or has done a great job. Um, and so for for many people readers in Germany, they will be able to read in their own language mm-hmm. uh, some of these other books that they don't currently have or extracts from some of these books that they don't have from the history of Middle Earth. Yeah. So I think that's great. I was about to say exactly that, because for us, this is tremendous that we now have access to, let's say, the the most important things that happen in the Second Age. And a lot of people, I mean, the history of Middle Earth is not like novels, right? So it's a bit tricky to read. And if it's not even your mother tongue, it's even trickier. So a lot of people cannot really access all of these informations. Of course, there's lots of online um, boards you can read things, but it's not the same than reading in Tolkien's voice. So this is, for us, is really great. And also the, the fall of Numina is, is like, um, I don't know, would you, would you say that? It's like a guide not only to the Second Age, but also to the events in the Lord of the Rings, like uh, oh, you've been saying, and absolutely. linking them. Yeah, yes. absolutely it is. And, and I think that gives you a much rounder picture of what Tolkien was, his complete vision. I've also, pre, as a sort of prologue to it, written a piece about, it's called Before the Second Age, mm-hmm. uh, and it's just a, an introduction to the ideas about the First Age. It doesn't seek to tell the whole of the First Age because that would be nonsense, <laughs> but it tries to at least give you an introduction to what has gone before, from the creation myths uh, through to the, the great stories, Beren and Luthien and, and uh, so on, mm-hmm. uh, and and often using Tolkien's way of explaining uh, the book Uh, what he wanted, what he saw in his mythology. We're very lucky because he wrote a letter to this a man called Martin Waldman. And Martin Waldman was worked for a publisher called William Collins, who was a, a rival publisher to George Allen and Unwin, who had published The Hobbit. And when Tolkien had reached the point of having written The Lord of the Rings, he was deeply, still deeply entrenched in writing The Silmarillion or gathering this material together. And he wanted very much for George Allen and Unwin to publish The Lord of the Rings and The Silmarillion. And they were nervous about doing it because it was uh, they thought it was a big project. They didn't know whether there would be a readership for it. Mm-hmm. And I think at the time there probably wouldn't have been, actually, to be truthful. But, you know, uh, th- that was they made a commercial decision. And Tolkien was very upset. And so he decided to approach a rival publisher. But that must have been quite a hard decision for him because I think he was, I think he realised that um, 
uh, Rainer Unwin, uh, who had read The Hobbit as a little yes. boy and recommended to his father that they should do the book, that George Allen and Unwin had actually you know, put him on the map, literally yes. on the map, <laughs> with The Hobbit. So he knew he was indebted to them as a publisher. But they weren't going to play ball with his vision. He wanted to see the whole great mythology there together. Uh, as we know, you know, that was his overwhelming, and he'd never achieved it all, but he gave us some amazing episodes and insights and a structure. Yeah. Um, and so he wrote to, to Martin Waldman and said, this is what you need to know about the Silmarillion, and this is what you need to know about the Lord of the Rings. And he gives him, he says, it's, I think he described it as a, as a sm small resume or something like that. It's, <laughs> it's actually over, over 5,000 words long uh, <laughs> and many pages. But so we have this, his immediate uh, understanding of what was the creation story about in mm -hmm. the Silmarillion. You know, what actually happened? He talks about there being a period between where stories move from story to history. Mm. Uh, and there's this kind of limbo where the myths and legends suddenly become something which is semi-historical uh, and folklorish and then becomes actual history. Um, and he describes all that. So I've drawn on that material as well. So people have a, when they begin, they will actually have the briefest, but mostly in his words, understanding of how he saw the cosmology and then the, the, the history of this unfolding world up to the, the beginning of the Second mm -hmm. Age. And, of course, briefly we deal with, with lots of notes so people can read it more about it later, how, of course, after the fall, fall of Numenor itself, the world is changed. This flat world becomes a round world. Yeah. You know, and and I love the fact that Tolkien talking about that says something to the effect of, well, you know, uh, I live on a round world. I, you know, I'm a writer who lives <laughs> on a world that I know is round. So at some point, this world has to be changed. Yes, and and I I really. I really like the whole concept of the fact that um, there's this passage of time um, because I believe it. I believe it's something that is we all are experienced, but we maybe uh, don't think about. Um, if you look at any any um, religious or philosophical kind of journey of people's thinking, uh, particularly in areas of faith and belief, that they all begin with images and ideas I and mean, there's the creation story that's in the judeo-christian uh, book of genesis in the in the bible uh, that is a similar story now of course there are people and i have to say this because there may be people listening <laughs> who think this there are people who see that absolutely literally mm. you know that god created the world in six days and didn't rest it on the seventh day actually did create a man called adam and a woman called eve and they were tempted by a serpent but but essentially, there's a point in the chronology of the what we call the Old Testament. There is a chronology there where things move from stories into people who can be traced historically through other sources. Um, and that, that journey is what Tolkien's writing about. And, and of course, essential to hit all of it, having mentioned Adam and Eve and the garden and the apple and all those things that people are very aware of, that Tolkien said that all stories are about a fall. And I, I don't know, I've never thought through every, in every instance, is that the case? But in his view, everything was about how something is created or comes about mm -hmm. and how it is then changed or destroyed or, cha or made into something else. Uh, and that may be good or bad, actually, because it may be that a bad thing is changed into something much better. But there's a fall of some kind that somebody has to be, and of course he was very, very strong, uh, believing Catholic, and, and this t chimes in with his Catholicism, that there's, there's a point at which everything is fallible and can fail because of people's uh, selfishness, their pride, their fallibility, mm. their greed, whatever it is. And of course, that's what happens to Sarah, to well, it's what happens to the people in Numenor, it's what happens to Sauron, it's what happens to again in the Lord of the Rings. You know, that's the and and I think it, it you know, one of the things we talk a lot about Frodo being the the hero of the Lord of the Rings, but of course, he's not, he's not because right at the moment when he could cast the ring into the crack of doom, that moment he falters, mm -hmm. and it's it's then, of course, as Gandalf points out. 
later that it's the mercy of having allowed Gollum to live that Gollum's own greed and selfishness overwhelms him and he seizes the ring from Frodo uh, and he he accomplishes the destruction by bizarrely. falling by falling again yeah. a fall yeah. yes and another yes. F- literal fall and, yes. a, and a, yeah <laughs> uh, so um, I think a lot of those things will come through to people I hope in this book serious things you know big thoughts big ideas um, but at the same time it will give people a kind of candle on what all these events were with all these kings and these rulers and how the how the place changed from this kind of perfect almost utopian island into something which was then just dis- totally destroyed by the gods because of their their ambition and their greed and how you know this fired and fueled the character who is Sauron mm. so when i think about you writing this book or working like your detective job on this book, I imagine you like Gandalf sitting in the libraries of Minas Tirith and trying to, you know, bring every piece of paper together. So how (laughs) could we imagine that? Did you draw from only what was already published or did you have like papers and snippets and you know backsides of i don't know what <laughs> scribblings uh tolkienian uh things there are and and uh, d- did you have like original material in in paper that would right. be some kind of archive uh yeah, well david said to me you should give these books to someone afterwards but uh, uh i didn't have any original documents i only worked from the published sources uh and I, I decided early on that I was going to touch my own books in my collection. So I, I, I bought all the volumes I needed in the current paperback. Uh, and I just said, these are now my working copies. <laughs> okay, I can write on them. I can turn over the corners of the page. I, I can put notes saying, see mm. page such and such, see volume, whatever. <clears throat> and that's how I worked, a very chaotic looking way of doing things together. But Having done that, I then made my own list of the order of events. So, you know, it was quite simple, really, because I would go to the date and I would think, well, what happens in this period? Right. And then I would, and I then checked every other volume in the history of Middle Earth. Is there anything lurking somewhere about this period or this person? Um, but no, a lot of paperbacks scribbled over. David said they must be, they'd be valuable. Tolkien people would buy them. And I said, well, <laughs> don't really think I want to show them all my scribblings out and crossings through. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, sometimes in some of the passages, I might use the whole of uh, half of one sentence and then uh, there's always indications. So there may be three dots uh, showing that something's been left out. And then I pick up from a different document, but it reads. Um, if I'd had the opportunity to do what Christopher did, of course, uh, then I would have made sure that they were linked. You know? yes. But that was not the that was not the purpose of the book, and it was not my the purpose of my job. So always, I was respectful of those sources. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, somebody else maybe at some time in the future could fill out some of those gaps. Mm-hmm. You know. Speaking of the purpose of the book, how did that book come to be? So you were contacted mm-hmm. and um, then you decided to take on this journey and this detective job. Yeah. But uh, do, do you know about the, 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 you know, the birth of the book? Uh, I, I don't know much more before, I, before it happened to me. Um, I was approached, first of all, to ask, be asked whether I would update uh, Robert Foster's uh, Guide to Middle Earth with material relating to what was in the Silmarillion which he uh, in Unfinished Tales which he hadn't had access to when he did it and the publishers had been trying for some time to contact uh, Robert Foster and uh, couldn't do so Uh, and I thought yes I could do that but um, obviously it was a really editorial job uh, and and quite a quite a um, I don't mean a boring, but I mean a very precise Mm -hmm. kind of job. It wasn't a lot of creativity involved in it. While I was possibly going to do that, um, the searches for Robert Foster produced Robert Foster. Oh, So he turned up uh, and they made contact with him and he has taken that job on and has done it himself, which is 
infinitely better than my doing it. So <laughs> the man who did the first you know, book is now doing it. And of course, uh, Tolkien himself knew Foster's book and in fact would quote to people in letters, you know, uh, Mr. Robert Foster tells me on page such and such of so and so. You know. So, uh, you know, that that's great mm-hmm. so in that moment with that moment of time there was talk about oh and we might sometime do something about Numenor but Amazon were not dis- were not doing tie-in books to the movie it's not really a it's not really a, <clears throat> a thing that television companies tend to do because mm-hmm. what they want to do is to get you to buy the the membership of Amazon Prime in this case so you can watch the series they're mm-hmm. not they're not out there to get you to buy a book in the shop so that you then go to the cinema to see it you know it's yes. it's instant instantly consumable and uh, I mean it may be there forever on Prime you know for you to go back and watch again and again but it, it's not the same as a movie release at all so I don't know whether they will do some books in the future they may well do but right now for the when the first season came to be released there were there were to be no other books mm-hmm. relating to it so that then meant that there was this was my my friend charles node in the tolkien society in britain <laughs> described this as being uh the tie-in book that is not a tie-in book uh, which is <laughs> i think an accurate description of it actually in that it, it ties into the series by virtue of the fact that it's about the second age but it is not a tie-in book in the sense that it doesn't make any reference to the Amazon project. I don't know anything about the Amazon project than what I had before its release, than what I had seen in the trailers. Mm. Because now I know what we all know, which is only so much because there's still several seasons to come. But um, you know, at that point, I I didn't had no knowledge of it, and it wasn't Harper Collins' uh, aim to produce a book that related to the Lord mm. of the Rings. It's a book. I think they and I certainly hope will be around for a lot longer than the Amazon series that it will be a book that people can always refer to at some point in the future so that was it I mean it is it is uh mostly people would say cashing into or tying into um the the Amazon project but I think it's a book that stands in its on its own merits Mm -hmm. and those merits are totally down to J.R.R. Tolkien and his editor's son, not mine. But I have to say before leaving this, I have to say that the book also has, and this is absolutely important because even if people think, and I've been told by several people this is just a cash cow, you know, you're just cashing in on something, it's not a, a genuine new book. And I accept that that's in a sense true, um, though it does have a form that people have not read the material in but previously. Um, but I have to say that, of course, the book has 10 colour plates by Alan Lee. It's got this amazing cover, which people saw very early on when the book was first announced, of the moment of the fall with the great wave mm. crashing on and the actually as though the whole of Numenor yes. is being turned, literally turned over. And in fact, with a tiny figure of Sauron standing on one of the disintegrating buildings just before his spirit flees and, and goes back, of course, to, to Mordor on Middle-earth. Uh, so it's a very powerful cover but there's some wonderful pictures inside um, so for example there's, uh, there's there's a terrific picture of Alderian setting out on his first voyage there's um, I think my favourite picture that he did created <laughs> which is this image of Galadriel leading the elves through Khazad Doom uh-huh. to, to the other side of the uh, of the mountains uh, and, and thence of course up to Lorien and it shows Khazad Doom in its glory as it was before it became corrupted before the the, the the you know the minds of moria seen in the lord of the rings yes. this is where all that extraordinary uh, architecture is all gilded and golden and there's this great procession of the elves meeting the dwarves as they pass through uh from one side of the the, the, the mountains to the to the other side i love that picture um there's another one which um of the building of baradur baradur in the process of being put up being built by you know 600 years i think it is that it takes uh to build <laughs> ages it, a, a long time uh, and and also another one which i i'm it's i say like it's not a, a like picture but it is what it is uh, which is when um sauron establishes uh the temple in on Numenor and and people are sacrificed and there's a, a procession of people going up the steps and this 
enormous structure about to be sacrificed with kind of rivers of blood and so on. I've made that rather sound rather more dramatic than it actually is because <laughs> Alan's a very subtle painter and artist. Yes. But in addition to these plates, and there's also uh, an image of uh, Farazon and his troops are sailing the, the Valar, um, which is with all the rocks and waves crashing down on their boats. Amazing pictures. In addition to the 10 plates and the cover, he has done over 60 pencil drawings. Uh, there are people, um, there are places, there are um, situations from, the, from the, these incidents that really flesh out the people. Several of these, he shows several of the kings and queens. So we, we, we have an image of these people. They're not just a name. Yes. You know, they actually have a, a kind of identity because of Alan's work. Some of his best work, I think, he's done. It's a great honour to have worked with Alan because his work is beautiful. We all know that. Um, and he's really done something here, which I don't think he's done quite before. You know, he was saying to me, like the Casa Doom picture, oh, I could be able to draw Casa Doom as it was Yes. You know, not not yes. to the way that he's always had to paint it, like you know, centuries later when it's all sort of decayed and abandoned. This is this is the vibrant yes. centre of the dwarf culture. It's a lovely, lovely picture of that. And and another intriguing one, I'm not going to describe it, but I'm just going to say that there's a wonderful <laughs> picture of the forging of the rings. And it's quite different from the way anybody else has ever painted uh, the forging of the rings. Um, I'm not going to say any more about it than that. <laughs> no, people but, should look into the book and see uh, yeah, for absolutely. themselves but, yes. it is, but it is not the way you've ever seen it depicted so alan alan's contribution to this book is enormous uh and i hope every anybody you know if people critic criticize me of the putting together the book fine but i hope that everybody will acknowledge alan's contribution to it and it actually if you just even as i said in fact to somebody who criticized already before seeing it criticized the book uh, i wrote to them and i said look Actually, just if you if you don't buy the book because it, my name has anything to do with it, uh, it, just buy the book because it's got some great images in it <laughs> that you're not going to want to miss. Yes. So uh, for me, that's that's enough of a validation. And Alan's work is brilliant. So. <laughs> How close uh, was your cooperation with Alan or your, your um, yeah, well, Alan work and, together? Well, I've known Alan for over 20 years and, and been friends. And I got to know him and, and of course, John Howe very quite closely when we were working mm -hmm. with the Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. And, and indeed, they were both, although the cast had all gone to other places when I was visiting Lord of the Rings, they were still busy working there in their studio. And I spent a lot of time with them uh, socially and, and uh, just asking them questions and things. So uh, they've both been good friends of mine for a long time. So it was great to work with Alan. And one of the things, the first conversation we had actually was to say, or he asked me, what scenes would you like to see mm -hmm. that, that, you know, you haven't seen somewhere else from the events in yes. this book? Uh, and I immediately said, oh, let's show the building of Baradur. Oh. Uh, because, you know, that that's we don't have that image. We have this great edifice. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, he said, and I'd like to do uh, the, this this idea of Galadriel passing through uh, Casadum. Is, uh, is the text to go with that, he said. Oh. And, I, and I said, oh, yeah, there's absolutely, there's a text, there's a description. And, it, and uh, in, there's a, a chapter on uh, 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 Galadriel and Celeborn where it talks about her passage through. And, and the fact that uh, Kellyborn would not go through the mine. He would not pass through the mines. So he, he had to go another way to get to where mm -hmm. they eventually lived in Lorien. Uh, and we don't know whether... Um, whether I mean, I surmise that he either had to go over one of the passes uh, across the mountains or he had to go down to what was later the Gap of Rowan mm -hmm. uh, and go round the bottom of the mountain range and up the other side. But So we had this conversation and uh, I said, Alan, there's enough there for that to yeah. be able to be an illustration. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that was great. So we had a conversation and we talked a bit about, well, what, what image could go for this? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> talking about Numenor, there's a chapter on the wildlife in Numenor and one of the fascinating little stories I'm sure you know this is about the animal life on Numenor that they had these bears and the bears lived there and the bears had this dance this kind of ritual where they'd come down towards the where the people lived and they would do this dance and so I said to, uh, to Alan 
it must be bears. There's got to be some bears somewhere. <laughs> and there's a, a really nice little vignette which shows part of the landscape, trees and flowers and, and some bears. Aww. So, you know, there's things like that. And, and so we had those conversations. So you were kind of free to decide what illustrations would be going to be in the book? Or was the publisher saying, it must be this, 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 no, the rest no. you're free to do? Uh, no, they, they, were, they were part of the conversation too. Mm -hmm. uh, David Braun and uh, my editor Chris Smith we we met we would meet as a sometimes just Chris Alan and I but uh, sometimes the four of us on Zoom and we'd chat through you know I'd like to do this and I'd say well there's the whole of this thing do we want to show um, what are we going to show about Aldarian because it's a long piece of text mm -hmm. um, so there's the wedding of where they wed where they meet so there's different elements of the story that are told there um, I wanted another image which again Alan produced produced which I thought was a very dramatic image uh, which is again I'll leave people to work out for themselves what it might be but the fate of Kelly Brimbor for example I thought as described by Tolkien in what what happened to him uh, after Sauron's um, army of you know orcs and forces had gone through um, the area uh, what would happen to Kelly Brimbo is, is told in the book and if you know that that image is is in there as a pencil mm -hmm. drawing um, and that, that's a very striking and slightly you know a, um, a vo quite a violent image um, but of course Alan's work is is very pastoral and and the the things which people I think will savor most are those views of cliffs and fields and you know the, mm. all those sort of rural things which he captures so beautifully naturalistically yes. um the ring dropping into the water with all the bubbles coming up from it uh, um yeah lots of wonderful images i don't want to spoil it by telling you all <laughs> i'm just checking my, so there, all it's of out my, there now yeah. so you can all go and buy it uh, or soon whichever <laughs> um, I'm just checking all of my questions that I have written down the great thing what I know now after three interviews with you is that I don't have to ask so much because you already because I talk too much yes no, absolutely you right no okay. it's perfect it's perfect because it spares me a lot of work and you know there are some people you really have to in German we say drag everything out of the nose <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think you've already answered all of my questions well no there's one left here for me to ask so this was a huge project that is being done now. So um, are you able to say or to, you know, um, talk about what other projects you might be doing in the future or are you already working on other projects? I'm not working on any other projects and uh, I'm not able to say anything about another project because I've not actually been asked yet to do one. <laughs> so, uh, I'm, so I'm not. I'm not uh, being particularly, you know, s serious or um, uh, cu uh, trying to be secretive about it mm. in any way. Uh, I'm just saying that I no, I don't know. Uh, I've been asked if if there was something whether I would be willing to do another project of some kind, having gone through this one, which has been quite a journey um, and it's been a journey because a lot of people have to be satisfied with this book mm. not Amazon we don't have to worry about Amazon Prime or <laughs> the makers of the Rings of Power we don't have to worry about them at all but you know there's a lot of other people who have to be satisfied there's obviously the fans mm -hmm. uh, very important because we're talking I'm talking now to and with fans uh, but also the, the publishers and the estate uh, you know all of whom have to be happy Happy with a project um, so there's been you know this the journey has been twofold it's been the journey of collecting and assembling and putting the material together and the journey of bringing everybody together uh, publisher um, rights owners the family the lawyers the estate uh, the artist and the editor <laughs> uh, to something which we all were happy with and liked and were comfortable with so that's been a bit of a journey that's been a double journey really and that's been great i'd love to do something else if something else comes along and it's something that i could do um 
you know, I, I never knew that I was going to write a radio version of The Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I didn't know quite a number of other things on uh, that were to happen to me later. You yes. know, I didn't know I would end up compiling an audio version of all the stuff from the BBC's archives of Tolkien himself, the audio portrait. I didn't know I'd <laughs> one day end up, despite cutting Tom Bombadil, writing a, a script for <laughs> Tom Bombadil. Uh, I didn't know I didn't know that I would do my own amateur stage version of the, of the Hobbit and play in it. Act in it. I didn't know any of those things would happen. I didn't know that. I thought. I frankly thought that I was unlikely. I'd do anything else with with Tolkien, uh, and then this came along. So I just <laughs> say, you know, the road and the career, and the opportunities go ever on, and I hope they will go on. So that's a, that's a really good um, ending to our interview. Uh, if there is not anything left that you would like to say and I haven't asked about or we haven't discussed yet, is there anything left you'd like to say? Or uh, Very briefly, and yes. that would be different, difficult for me. Very briefly, uh, how much I uh, respect, I think people know this, how much I respect uh, the fans of, of everything, that, uh, of Tolkien's fans, wherever they are, uh, particularly because I've had pleasure of spending time with you uh, those of you in Germany but um, just that how much I respect your your on the way in which you honor the author uh, because that's really I think that's really important um, and you know the books the books the books are great and everybody loves them or they'd love love them or loathe them we know Tolkien's famous <laughs> line you know uh, the Lord of the Rings is one of those things if you like it you do if you don't then you boo uh, <laughs> and he he understood that yes. um, but you know you are the people who like it you're the ones who like it who do and uh, you cheer and and it's great that you do that and and As, as the person I am and the jobs that I've done, I really uh, value and thank you for the friendship that you give to people like me who are really just fellow travelers with you on that road that goes ever on. But but um, you you do us great honor and, and uh, friendship, and I'm very pleased to have shared back then in the uh, the um, Tolkien Ting the the opportunity to share fellowship with you this Aww. year earlier this year and uh, uh opportunities to do so again at other events i'm sure you know? thank you brian i just i could give everything just back to you because it's been so wonderful and it's it's been so particularly nice to now have another interview with you and being able to talk to you again and it's been such a tremendous year and so much has happened so far and so much maybe will still happen who knows so thank you very, very much for your time, for your effort, for your tremendous answers, for your insights in your detective job that you've given us. And I hope to see and speak to you ever again so soon, I hope. And it's been so wonderful to have you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you for your friendship too. Thank you. Take care, Brian. Will do. 